Uh, the next speaker is uh, David Redout. So, David, please. Thank you very much for the opportunity to talk. Uh, I think Ivan and I have been close for quite a long time. Um, I thought, uh, you know, I wasn't sure whether the audience would consist of specialists in Ivan's research area or whether it would be full of people coming along just to wish him the best. I hope it's the latter. So I've prepared something which is probably a little less uh, technical than, uh, than, than, than one might otherwise think, but uh, hopefully it'll still be interesting. So I've started with a little bit of memories. So there's some uh, pictures for you to enjoy while, uh, while I talk about myself. So <laughs> feel free to uh, jump in and uh, either complain, make corrections, or just generally comment. It's all fun. So uh, I've said here that I first met Ivan in either 2006 or 2007. So I was a, uh, a postdoc at Université Laval with Pierre Mathieu. And I think I probably met Ivan in 2006 because I remember coming down to the CRM to give a seminar. And I think he was there in the audience and he introduced himself to me afterwards, but we didn't actually speak scientifically at all. So uh, I think at some point in 2007, after the snow melted, he came up to uh, Quebec and gave a seminar there. And uh, I remember very clearly walking over to get lunch with him after the seminar and just having this wonderful conversation about his work on the easing model. And I think it might've been actually with Louis Pierre. And uh, there was uh, various uh, sort of critical exponents, if we can call them that, which, uh, which were uh, associated with entries which lived sort of in an extended CATS table. So not in the standard CATS table of the minimal models that you read about in your textbooks. And so this was uh, super interesting to me. I'd uh, sort of, you know, vaguely heard about things like logarithmic CFTs and I knew people like Jörn were doing, uh, were doing things in this area and I wanted to know more about it. And so, uh, you know, I said to Ivan, so if I wanted to work on the easing model on this kind of, uh, you know, non-local observables, how would I get started? And he said, don't start with the easing model. You should start with something easier like percolation. Now, I don't know if he was being facetious or not, but I took him at face value. And uh, yeah, so uh, Pierre and I started working on, uh, on, on, uh, on an algebraic approach to percolation. And uh, I think by August, we'd, uh, we had our first uh, very short, admittedly, but still first night paper in the area. And so that was kind of uh, where I sort of think of myself as sort of beginning as a, uh, as a, uh, as a researcher. As I say, feel free to jump in and correct me, Ivan, if you disagree with anything I'm saying. Hopefully it won't be too embarrassing. So some of you will know that Ivan also uh, gave me a postdoc in uh, 2009 to 10. So I was at the CRM for a year. It could have been for two years, but unfortunately I ended up getting a very nice fellowship back in Australia. It was the kind of thing that you didn't turn down, even though it was in Canberra, which is not a great place to live. I would have much preferred to live in uh, Montreal for an extra year, but uh, that's the way the cookie crumbles. But one of the nice things about uh, about knowing that I had a uh, job to get back to in Australia, five years of funding. So there's an aeroplane going overhead, a bit loud. Um, so one of the nice things about being in, uh, in Montreal in this situation was that I could effectively do anything I want. And uh, after talking with Ivan for a couple of months, we decided that we would uh, spend the year trying to teach ourselves the mathematics of Templi Lieb algebras. So these were things which I didn't have uh, very much experience with, although I had been, you know, particularly in Australia, been to many seminars with people talking about them because they're extremely important in many areas of statistical uh, mechanics. So yeah, the, we sat down and it was, uh, it was one of the most uh, wonderful mathematical experiences of my life. And I think it, it, it taught me to, uh, to really trust pure mathematics again after, uh, after many years as a, uh, as a mathematical physicist. It was, uh, it was, it was a wonderful experience. And uh, after much uh, prompting, we eventually, uh, it took quite a few years, but we eventually wrote our own little review of this uh, beautiful area, which uh, apparently other th people also think is quite beautiful. So uh, I'm, uh, I'm very grateful to Ivan for the opportunity to, uh, to learn this and to uh, share the experience of writing with him, which was, uh, which was certainly a, a, a huge learning experience and also, uh, at times it was probably painful for him, but uh, I think it was a wonderful, uh, a wonderful time. I want to explain today, a lot of what I learned about the Templi Lieb algebra is heavily influenced what I, uh, what I ended up doing in, uh, in, in, in log CFT. So um, yeah, 
So one more picture and then I can stop embarrassing you. Here is a uh, picture from, uh, from Ivan's birthday party in 2013 at our home in Canberra. You can see how happy he is. But uh, big thanks to Ivan. You've been uh, a wonderful friend over the years. First supervisor, but also mentor and collaborator, colleague, and of course, friend. All right, so if you've all enjoyed that, and I'm assuming that you can all actually still hear me, then uh, I will actually start with the uh, scientific content. So as I said, this is aimed at a crowd which is probably not uh, expert in, uh, in log CFT or even in uh, statistical physics. So uh, let me start by just going through a, uh, a couple of notions, symmetry, reducibility, and how this is encoded in a uh, pure mathematical context. And then we'll talk about a few examples, so four examples, whose purpose is really just to illustrate that uh, this notion of symmetry and reducibility is not just a one trick pony. It comes up in, uh, in several areas. And, uh, and then I'll talk about, uh, well, I've, I've called the diamonds in the rough. We'll see what that is. Hopefully I'll get to it. Let me know if I run out of time because I don't have a clock on this thing. Maybe I should open up a clock. All right, so in terms of uh, symmetry, uh, I guess everybody here hopefully knows that um, if, you, uh, if, if, you, if you talk to people about what symmetry means in quantum theory, then one of the first things that will come up is, uh, is, is, is Wigner's characterization of elementary particles. And so he says, well, you should model them as irreducible representations of the Poincaré group. And the point is that being an irreducible representation means that you can't break it up into smaller pieces, which is just like what you have with an elementary particle. It's the whole raison d'etre is that you can't break them up into smaller pieces. So that seems like a pretty good definition. But uh, you might also want to try to model a particle which does have some internal structure. So maybe you want to admit the existence of quarks, but you don't want to treat them as uh, separate things entirely. Or maybe you have some sort of particle which you know is sometimes in an unstable state and it can transition to a stable state. And so, you know, all of these types of uh, uh, models may lead you to say, well, irreducible is not quite the right thing. Maybe I need something a little more, more general, a little more interesting. So from a mathematical point of view, if you have an irreducible representation, that means you have exactly two invariant subspaces. Right? You always have the representation space itself, but you can also have the trivial sub-representation. So that's irreducible. And if, uh, if you have a representation that you can write as a direct sum of irreducibles, then you call it completely reducible. So that's all pretty standard stuff. Hopefully we learned that in kindergarten. And we learned it in kindergarten for a very good reason, because most of the algebraic objects which we come across as math physicists have the property that their representations are completely reducible. So, you know, finite groups, compact Lie groups, semi-simple Lie algebras, as long as you're working over C, which is a good math physicist I always am, then you're always going to get completely reducible representation. All right, unfortunately, in the big bad world of general algebra, uh, complete reducibility is extremely rare. It's sort of, you know, in the, uh, in the space of uh, algebraic uh, objects, this probably has measure zero. But, you know, there is uh, uh, a silver lining in that, uh, in, uh, in most math examples, you can still look at um, things that you can't break up into direct sums. And we call these things indecomposable representations. So uh, what you can have in this case, unlike an irreducible representation, you might have a non-trivial proper invariant subspace. So here I've said uh, you might have a W, which is not zero, but it's properly contained inside your uh, representation V. And the point is that just because you have a W doesn't mean that there's another W prime, which is complementary. You can't write V as a direct sum of W and some other W prime. It can't be done. And so this happens, unfortunately, for some types of algebras, most types of algebras. And uh, you, know, you can say, oh, I don't like that. I don't want to have to deal with that. But sometimes, particularly in uh, physical applications in our field, you have to man up and deal with it. That's just the way it is. So, you know, that's the way it is. Let's, uh, let's see what that entails. I want to start with some examples. Feel free to ask me any questions as we go. I'm uh, totally open to not finishing. But uh, my first example is uh, Lie superalgebras, which of course famously were introduced into physics because physics involves fermions and fermions anti-commute. 
So uh, simple least super algebras, unfortunately, have uh, reducible but indeed composable finite dimensional representations. That's uh, almost all of them do. There's sort of uh, one series which do not, but they're definitely in the minority. So I'll give you an example, which is not actually a, uh, a simple lead super algebra, but nevertheless uh, captures the essence, I think. So this is GL11. So you can think of these as being two by two matrices where we consider one of the, uh, the, the, the top left and the bottom right entry to be um, bosonic even, and the off diagonal entries to be fermionic or odd. And so we can uh, span this with, uh, with two bosons, which I'm calling E and N, and two fermions, psi plus and psi minus. All right, and so, you know, if you just write down the, uh, the four elementary matrices and uh, the two diagonal, yeah. the two ones, two diagonal ones, E and N, and the off diagonal ones being the fermions, psi plus and psi minus, you can write down their commutation and anti-commutation rules, and you're like, oh, great, I've got all these super algebra. It's not so hard. But if you look at the algebra itself, you realize pretty quickly that it's one of these reducible but indeed composable guides. Uh, the adjoint representation is itself not an irreducible module. And so uh, I like to draw this with this funny little diamond picture here. So you can see I've got N at the top. And what I mean by this is that if you start from N, then you can use the commutation relations to get your psi plus and your psi minus. And you see, this is the content of the commutation relation above. Uh, you can act. Um, on N, commute with psi plus and you'll end up with psi plus. If you commute with psi minus, you'll end up with minus psi minus. So you can get from N to the fermions and then from the fermions, you can get to E, right? So that's the second uh, relation up above. That's the anti-commutation relation. Start with psi plus, commute it with psi minus, you get E, right? But the point is that you can't go backwards, right? E is in fact central, it commutes with everything. It's actually the identity matrix, I didn't say that. And so you can, uh, you can try to commute with E, but you'll never get uh, anything but zero. So that's kind of a dead end. And if you have one of the size, you can't, can't get back to N, right? You'll notice in the relations above the diamond that N doesn't appear on the right-hand side. You can't get back, right? So this is a reducible but indecomposable representation of the Lee super algebra GL11. And this is normal, this is normal. And you have to deal with it, you know, if you have any questions. Second example. Quantum groups, right? Everybody loves quantum groups. These things are so important. UQSL2 is the one we first learn, maybe not in kindergarten, let's say in primary school. So you come across and you say, okay, first of all, I have to learn about a Lie uh, algebra or a Lie super algebra. And then I learn about the universal enveloping algebra. And then you realize that it's possible to deform this by a parameter Q, which we may as well pretend is a complex number because we're physicists. All right, so UQSL2 is generated by three guys, E, F, and H. It's a uh, unital associative algebra. It's got some relations which look like this. If you know them, you love them. If you don't, you don't care. But the point is that uh, if you're uh, looking for representations and if you take this parameter Q to be a root of unity, then it's really easy to construct reducible but indecomposable ones. So, uh, you know, like SL2, this has irreducible representations. In particular, it has a two-dimensional representation, which I've uh, 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 chosen two basis vectors, V and W. So the arrows in my diagram here, the one from V to W is the action of F. The arrow from W to V is the action of E. So we've got, uh, we've got um, a two-dimensional representation, the eigenvalues of K, are in this case, um, what are they? Q to the one and Q to the minus one. And of course, here I'd set Q to be equal to I, the fourth root of unity. So the eigenvalues on V would be I and the eigenvalue on W would be the inverse of I minus I. And so you can sit down and you can compute the tensor product of this representation with itself. I should have said that these uh, quantum groups are Hopf algebras. So you get a coproduct as part of the definition, which I didn't bother writing down, but that means you can compute their tensor product. And when you do so, you find that for this particular Q, this tensor product gives you a, a reducible but indeed composable representation. And as an exercise for those of you uh, sitting in the uh, lecture theater enjoying yourself, you can check to make sure that, uh, that these uh, basis vectors are indeed correct. If you start from the one at the top and then you act with, let's say F or E or some other element perhaps, you can get to V tensor V and W tensor W and then acting again, gets you down to the guy at the bottom.
right? So uh, reducible but in decomposable representation. The important point is you can't get back. Those arrows are one-way arrows. You cannot get back by acting with, uh, with your quantum group. Pretty cool. But you know that quantum groups have a lot to do with integrability, a huge amount to do with integrability and more besides. So uh, I don't know, uh, maybe Alexi will talk later about uh, various uh, relations involving transfer matrices. So there are TT relations, TQ relations, and even QQ relations. Well, what these things are is actually sort of, uh, like to say character versions, roughly speaking, of uh, these tensor products. And they're only useful because the uh, result of applying the tensor product gives you something which is, uh, which is uh, occasionally reducible but indecomposable. So these, uh, these relations exist because of this weird representation theoretic structure which we're discussing here. All right, that was the second example. Who's ready for number three? I hope Ivan's ready. I hope he hasn't fallen asleep. The third example is maybe his favorite, Templi Lieb algebra. So uh, these guys come up all the time when you're looking at lattice models in two dimensions, maybe even higher dimensions, I don't know. So it's the unital associative algebra, much like our quantum group. There's actually a close relation between the quantum group that we had and this, uh, this uh, associative algebra, but that's another talk entirely. There's some nice relations and there's a lovely graphical interpretation, which uh, if I were better at writing slides, I would actually put in, but uh, I was too lazy. Um, the point again is that uh, if you take uh, certain parameters, so these uh, templi lieb algebras, they, uh, they have n minus one generators, so there's an n parameter, but uh, there's also a complex number beta. And uh, if, you, uh, if you choose that parameter just so, then once again, you will also get uh, reducible but in decomposable representations. And for some reason, I put that parameter as being I, which I think is incorrect in my diagram. <laughs> it's definitely incorrect. So uh, I guess uh, that should be zero. But in any case, uh, what you can do is you can take the templi leave algebra. It's an associative algebra, so you can act on it from the left. Right? This is called the left regular representation. And then you can say, how do I decompose this algebra? So you say, all right, let me play around with this for a while. And if you're sufficiently uh, well-versed in the art of uh, associative algebras, you can uh, realize that you get five copies of a representation that I've drawn on the left, four copies of a representation in the middle, and just a single copy of the representation on the right. And uh, I've uh, chosen to draw these diagrams, not by, uh, sorry, draw these representations in a way which is probably a little bit obtuse, but essentially what I'm saying is that there is uh, a uh, five-dimensional uh, uh, space, subspace at the top left. And uh, when you act with the templi lieb algebra, uh, you can you know, move around in the subspace, but you can also end up moving down into a four-dimensional subspace, a different four-dimensional subspace. And then if you act with templi lieb again, you have the option of moving down to a different five-dimensional subspace. And, uh, and you cannot go backwards. So uh, once you've gone down, you can't go back. And it's the same with the other diagrams. And uh, so in, 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 in this case, once again, what we end up with is a whole bunch of reducible but decomposable representations, this time of the templi lieb algebra. So here, of course, we have relations to important models like uh, the Q-state POTS model, easing model, percolation. So you know, all of these cases correspond to the betas in which we have this type of representation theory, reducible but indecomposable representations everywhere. Okay, so how are we doing for time? Got time for another example, a little bit of time. So the last example is one which is a bit closer to the type of things which, uh, which I used to do, and in fact, which Jörn used to do as well, and quite a few other people around the world. So the Virasoro algebra is the symmetry algebra of uh, conformal invariance in two dimensions. And so in particular, if you study CFT in two dimensions, either because you want to understand scaling limits of statistical models or because you're a string theorist, which is kind of a, uh, a bad thing to say these days, I hear, then uh, you, you, you're, you're going to be well-versed with the representation theory of the Virasoro algebra. So it is an infinite dimensional Lie algebra. It's not quite simple. It is in fact the central extension of a uh, universal central extension of a simple infinite dimensional uh, complex Lie algebra. 
but uh, it has quite nice commutation relations. So I've written them down there just in case you, uh, you need reminding. I don't think you do. And there is uh, the central element C and uh, its eigenvalue um, on a given representation is called the central charge. So, uh, you know, the, uh, the, represent the irreducible representations which are interesting in uh, conformal field theory are parameterized by the central charge and something called a uh, conformal dimension. And in fact, this is the minimal conformal dimension and it's the uh, smallest eigenvalue of L naught on the irreducible. It's like we had tensor products of uh, quantum group representations, there's something called the fusion product of a uh, representation of a Virasoro algebra. Um, this thing uh, is, uh, is perfectly capable of producing reducible but indecomposable representations from irreducibles. And uh, this was uh, one of the uh, first uh, calculations that I ever did when I started in uh, log CFT. So in this case, uh, it turns out that when the central charge is zero, which corresponds to critical percolation, then you can um, fuse the irreducible module whose conformal dimension happens to be one third. You can fuse it with itself. You get back a copy of that module again, and then direct sum with a reducible but indecomposable module, which is formed from four irreducible modules of the Virasoro algebra. Each of these is infinite dimensional. Once again, <clears throat> you can look at a subspace which formally looks like an L2, and then you can act on it with Virasoro and you can end up in an L0 or an L5. And then you can act on those with Virasoro and end up with a completely different L2. And so, uh, yeah, so this is, uh, this is actually an important uh, observation. These uh, uh, reducible but indecomposable representations arise in the scaling limit of critical percolation. So there's a nice story here, which is that uh, in a very famous paper, John Cardi wrote down, um, uh, computed a correlation function in some conformal field theory, which he didn't really explain properly, which is uh, which was uh, supposed to give you the horizontal crossing probability for uh, the critical percolation. And this, of course, agreed extremely well with the numerical results which Ivan had worked out with, uh, I believe it was with, with, with uh, Robert Langlands. And uh, so, you know, the numerics agree with the analytics, so this was clearly right. But uh, in fact, uh, it's a fairly straightforward from a modern perspective to see that the only way that Cardi's calculation can be right is if, uh, is if the conformal field theory involves reducible but indecomposable representations. There's sort of no, uh, no, uh, no way out. This is, uh, this is the kind of thing which uh, you just have to deal with if you're, uh, if you're serious about conformal field theory these days. Okay. So maybe that's, uh, that's a bit too much self-promotion. We're here to talk about Ivan. Um, one of the things that you may have noticed is that this sort of uh, pattern which I'm drawing again and again is kind of like a diamond. I've got four things and I'm drawing arrows between them. So let me refer to this as diamonds in the rough, paraphrasing from that wonderful movie Aladdin. <laughs> I know that's not the original thought. But yeah, this diamond shape, which was occasionally truncated in the Templey lead case, a few, uh, one, one of the... Uh, uh, one of the entries was actually missing in some of the uh, uh, representations, but these these diamonds seem to crop up all the time, at least in uh, in, in our examples. And uh, what's uh, perhaps even more important here with these diamonds is that in each case you can find somewhere inside the algebra or in some completion of the algebra, you can find an element that's central, self-adjoint, and its action is not diagonalizable. Right. So this sounds like a contradiction. How can it be self-adjoint and not diagonalizable? Well, that's because there is no inner product on these representations. There is often a notion of an invariant bilinear form, but it will not be positive definite. In fact, it cannot be positive definite with these representations. And so, uh, and so we, because of that, we, uh, we do not have the theorem that self-adjointness means diagonalizability. So this doesn't happen. All right, so back to GL11. The uh, central element that, uh, that has this crazy property is just the quadratic Casimir. You can write down Casimir elements for Lie superalgebras. And for the quantum group UQSL2, it's also the quadratic Casimir. So those are nice, easy, familiar guys. So the Templey Lieb algebras, uh, turns out that the, uh, the, 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 uh, the thing you want uh, in this case is something called the braid transfer matrix, which was, I think, not particularly well known in the math literature. 
and uh, I think uh, I think uh, you know in our in in the review paper I wrote with Ivan, we uh, we devoted quite a bit of time to showing that this was indeed the case, that uh, that we had a non-diagonalizable uh, action of the uh, of the braid transfer matrix. All right, in the case of the Virasoro, it's uh, well. You could say it's the uh, the Virasoro zero mode L naught, which is uh, in a sense like the Hamiltonian of the conformal field theory. That thing is not diagonalizable. It's not central. So, but if you take uh, cos of two pi times L naught, then that becomes central in your algebra. So, in some extension of the algebra. So that fits the bill here. That's a non-diagonalizable self-adjoint operator. All right, the other thing which is good to know, it's not diagonalizable. So if you harken back to your linear algebra, you're like, oh, that means it has Jordan blocks. What is the rank of my Jordan blocks? In each case, it's two. So basically, the thing at the top of my diamond is the, uh, is the Jordan partners. And the thing at the bottom consists of the eigenvectors. So uh, this uh, um, central self-adjoint but non-diagonalizable element just takes me roughly speaking, from the top to the bottom. All right, how much more time do I have, guys? I have uh, seven or eight minutes, uh, David. Ah, oh, lovely. That's very generous. All right. So being as, uh, being as I'm most of the way through, I can indulge myself by being a little tiny bit more technical. Um, in all of these cases, these diamond representations, you know, if we treat matters uh, carefully, um, we can uh, we can see that they have even nicer mathematical properties, right? So maybe you're thinking they're not very nice so far, but uh, you know once you uh, have to deal with these things, then uh, then there's certain nice things that you would like. And so in particular, these diamonds turn out to be projective, and that's sort of a maximality type of property. What it means is that these diamonds can't appear as a quotient of any strictly larger reducible but in decomposable representation. Right, so projective is kind of as big as you can get as a quotient. Right? If you have something bigger and the projective appears as a quotient, that means it splits off as a direct sum out. So uh, it turns out that in all these cases, the diamonds are also injective, which is even better. It means that it can't appear as an invariant subspace or a submodule of a strictly larger reducible but indecomposable representation. Right? So these really are maximal as far as being uh, in reducible but in decomposable. Right? They're sort of as big as you can get in a sense. All right. However, once you, uh, once you realize this, then there's this huge machinery of homological algebra, which allows you to compute almost anything you might want about your representations. So if you want to know whether or not you can glue together two irreducible modules together and get some weird indecomposable one, the way to do it is to know what your projectives or your injectives are and then you construct what's called projective resolution. And then there's a, a, a rather uh, uh, intricate theory, which allows you to basically say not only whether you can glue two irreducibles together, this is called extension groups. It also tells you how many different ways there are of doing it. So uh, these uh, identifying these things, these diamonds as uh, being projective and injective is a big deal. It allows you to do a lot. And uh, in a sense, that means that these things are sort of like a nice uh, generalization of the familiar properties where we have complete reducibility. So in, uh, in nice simple examples where all the representations are completely reducible, it turns out that every irreducible is projective and injective. You can never glue anything together. They always split apart as direct sums, but this, uh, these diamonds are sort of the generalization, the nice, uh, the nice versions. So that's all very nice. We also have another property, which uh, is definitely not shared by, uh, by, uh, by, by representations in general, but this is something which seems to crop up far more often than it should in uh, physical applications. So the irreducibles are in bijective, bijection with the projectives and the injectives, but uh, they, uh, they are in such a way which is well, quite interesting to paraphrase Stephen Fry. So if you, uh, if you have a look at the number of times that you, you, can, you can take these irreducibles and just order them in any way you like, right? And then you can order the, uh, let's say the projectives, the diamonds in any way you like as well. But uh, maybe you order them in such a way that the, uh, that the uh, representation at the top, the irreducible representation at the top of your diamond is, uh, is in the same order as, uh, as you have your irreducible. All right, so 
what you can do then is you can now write down a matrix. And so you can say in that matrix, the ij entry is the number of times that the ith irreducible appears in the jth diamond. So it's a little bit strange, but you can do that. And unfortunately, people call this the Carton matrix. It has nothing to do with the Carton matrix of Lie theory. Nothing to do whatsoever. But uh, nevertheless, that seems to be a name. Well, in all of these examples, when you write down this Carton matrix, you can factorize it. You can write it as D times the transpose of D. And so when this happens, people call D the decomposition matrix. And this is sort of indicating uh, some more beautiful structure. So the decomposition matrix will then tell you how many times the ith irreducible appears in a jth something else, right? So there's some other sort of intermediate module between the irreducibles and the, uh, and the projectives. And so these things are sometimes called standard representations. And so this is sort of now giving us like a three tiered uh, viewpoint on the important representations in our theory. And so for GL11, the standard representations are called CATS representations, but in this case, they're actually just the same as our Verma representations. So this is, uh, these are fairly well-known objects. For our quantum group, they're exactly the Verma representations. In the Templi Lieb, these are what are called cell representations introduced by Graham and Lehrer back in their, uh, back in their famous uh, uh, paper on, uh, on cellularity. And for Virasoro, I think it's fair to, uh, to, uh, to say that we believe that the intermediate representations are what are called CATS representations by um, Jörn and uh, Paul Pierce and uh, Chabonard Zubert. So, you know, in all, uh, in all the cases which we've looked at today, at least, uh, this, uh, this nice sort of uh, standard representations appear and uh, provide us with even more structure about our... Uh, about our, uh, our representations, our representation theory. And you know, this is the kind of thing which, uh, which as an algebraic sort of physicist makes me stand up and take notice. And I think it was really uh, in uh, coming to grips with this with the template Lieb algebra and, uh, and, uh, and really understanding these in detail that, uh, that kind of set my sight. So this should work in pretty much all decent physical applications. What else can we say? Well, if you include one other similar property, which I won't go into, diamond representations are actually what are called tilting representations. So Jonathan knows a lot more about this than I do, but tilting basically means that you can filter the, uh, uh, the projectives into standard representations and indeed something called co-standard representation. So you can break them up in just the right way. And this factorization is basically a reflection of that fact. And uh, we call this factorization BGG reciprocity. And BGG stands for Bernstein Gelfand Gelfand. And so the reason for this is that if you take a look, if you go to your semi simple Lie algebra, where of course you know, <laughs> the irreducibles, at least the finite dimensional irreducibles, are completely reducible, you can do something silly and take uh, Verma modules for those and um, then talk about this category O of representations, which were introduced by Bernstein Gelfand and Gelfand. And what happens there is that you have exactly this sort of triality or trichotomy where you have irreducibles in one layer, the Verma modules in another layer and projectives over the top. And uh, yeah, you have exactly this structure where the uh, Carton matrix number of irreducibles and projectives factorizes. So you have uh, factorizes into the number of irreducibles in a Verma and the number of Vermas in projectives. So this is uh, sort of the, uh, the classical observation. And what we're seeing in our physical applications is this same structure again and again and again. So this was uh, abstracted. Klein, Partial and Scott introduced uh, highest weight categories to make uh, sense of the observation that this happens quite a lot. And Irving, um, at kind of a similar time, introduced what he called BGG categories, which are slightly stronger. From a mathematical point of view, it's just crazy that this kind of uh, structure uh, should appear. It's incredibly rare, but I think uh, this is something which we should be aware of as physicists because uh, in the 21st century, we're gonna be dealing with indecomposability and we're seeing them in all of these physically relevant uh, theories. We're always seeing these nice properties again and again and again. That's my, uh, that's my thesis for today. Do I have any time left or am I out? You have time to conclude. I have time to conclude. 
well, my conclusions will be very uh, short, but uh, let me first say, irreducible representations are fairly well understood. I mean, you know, there's still some work to actually find them. Reducible but indecomposable ones can be extremely difficult to understand. So there is a thing in the literature called tame versus wild. Almost all algebras are wild. And when your algebra is wild, that means that you cannot classify the indecomposable representations. You just can't do it. So that doesn't mean you can't classify the ones which are actually important to you in your application. So in my case, it's often enough to classify the projectives and the injectives and understand the standard modules. And this is, uh, this is something which uh, is still very difficult in my area. Otherwise it would have already been done, but, uh, but it's certainly, uh, certainly uh, a lot easier than trying to classify all of them. Um, the diamond representations, which I've advertised here, are certainly not, uh, not exhaustive. In the examples which we've looked at, this is about as bad as they get. But you know, I've given you some of the very simplest examples. And sometimes you're forced to go to more complicated physical models where you have much more complicated and decomposables. So there's uh, a huge amount of knowledge in the mathematical literature about how this can work. But I think as physicists, we're only now just sort of exploring what's possible in our physical models and seeing how, uh, how complicated things can get. I think the answer is arbitrarily complicated. And so we need to learn from the mathematicians what are the good tools to understand our physical models in, uh, in, this, uh, in this new age. Anyway, this is uh, the way it uh, has to be. I would like to thank Ivan along with so many other people because uh, the work that, uh, that he has done and some of the work that we have done together is, uh, is certainly uh, leading to uh, an improvement in my understanding. Uh, of all of this uh, of all of this beautiful mathematics so uh, that's the end of my talk thank you very much for paying attention and listening and I will conclude with a picture to show um, an example where things are slightly more complicated I won't try to explain the structure except to say that this is from a, a recent article on the archive where I uh, conjecture the structure of the projective cover of a vacuum module in a logarithmic conformal field theory corresponding to a rank two Lie algebra. So it's a little bit more complicated than a diamond. If you look closely, you can see lots of diamonds in this picture. They're just all glued together in some weird way to make up this uh, conjectured projective structure. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, David, for what I will call a, a gem of a lecture. Yes, I can hear you. Okay, there great. I was just wondering, many times you alluded to uh, representations which were of physical interest and uh, th those diamond shapes, for example. Is there a way or a mathematical way to single out, for example, the subcategories which would correspond to uh, those of physical interest? Um, wow, that is a really good question. I would say that that is part of the art of being a mathematical physicist, picking the right category for the job. And sometimes okay. it's not obvious at all. No. Okay, but what I was meaning by this is like, for example, you you look at the, a certain, you, you have a certain functor and you look at modules which are annihilated by this functor and form like full subcategories of this form. Like, is this a sort of process you're doing? I think yes, but I think, uh, look, to be honest, I think the idea of, you know, picking a physically relevant category, this is part of your physical input. Now, is it, uh, well, yeah, look, I, I do think this is a hard question in general. You know, sometimes you might just be handed a, a set of representations and you said, okay, here we go. And then it's, it's fairly easy to build up a category from this. You know, it might be the category of integrable highest weight modules, for example. You might be just given them and that's it. When you're not given them, there can be an art to it because you want to be able to exploit mathematical properties you want to be able to say okay if I want to prove something about my physical model I need to have a nice category and you know just because you're told what the irreducibles are that doesn't mean you know what the category is you know you might say it might need to be closed under this or it might need to be so I think it's actually a very subtle question in general I don't think physics specifies the category for you to a certain extent, you have to take a category that's big enough so that you have the elbow room to do what you need. But uh, in a sense, you also have to fine tune the category so that you have the mathematical tools in order to prove the things you want to prove. I'm not sure that answers your question, but that's, that's my philosophy on this.
Thank you, David, for not reacting before. We have uh, microphones going around, and I didn't get to yeah. get it before now. So thank you for... You should have your own microphone, Ivan. What's going uh, yes. on? Well, yeah, it's already half the day, so but uh, I'll try to get it. <laughs> three, three very quick uh, comments. So yeah. the braid limit you alluded for temporarily leave, uh, we wrote it, wrote about it in our review paper, but I think it, it stems from... Uh, the observation by Alexis Morin Duchesne uh, in the previous yes. paper with me. But I yes. wanted to give credit yes. to that. You didn't introduce us to the young gentleman on all the pictures that stands beside me. <laughs> and yeah. uh, the last comment, I'm not totally sure how you label your simple in your TL6 example, but since you'll be here next week, you'll explain that to me. And, and yeah. maybe a fourth one, your statement about what's physically relevant is spectacularly uh, vivid on the case of percolation, since <laughs> the only unitary representation is the one dimensional one. So you're not going to get any physics out of a one dimensional representation. And then what's the relevant uh, representation that you need to consider as being the work of many physicists, you among them? Thank you. I think it, it's still an open question. Thanks, Ivan. Even even something like percolation, the story is not uh, is not finished. Dommage. We'll just have to do some more work. Okay. So uh, I also have a question, which is maybe more vague than the previous questions or com or comments. But uh, so we saw these uh, diamond uh, shaped uh, Loewy diagrams uh, in your talk, and uh, I can't help but wonder if this is just like some sort of hidden SL two symmetry that uh, is inside those, uh, those algebras. Well, it's, like, mm, yeah. like, it's, it's, I, I would say it's, it's kind of like a rank one symmetry in that sense, yes. So okay. We see these things in sort of the simplest examples. So temporary leave is kind of rank one, as you know, UQSL2, obviously. GL11 does not really have an SL2 sitting inside it, but it's mm -hmm. kind of rank one. I mean, some people would argue it's rank two because it's got a two-dimensional carton, but... E is central, so it doesn't really do much. It's it's really rank one. So the diamonds seem to be as, as bad as it gets when you have this sort of rank one structure. And as soon as you start going up to uh, to higher ranks, you get pictures which are more like that uh, beautiful picture I put on the last slide. Okay, so that would be like the equivalent of, a, of the diamond uh, structure for rank two. This is one of the equivalents, yeah. You, you still can also get diamonds. So what happens is that uh, depending on, uh, on the simple module that you choose for the top, you can uh, either get a diamond or you can get something that looks like that. There's actually, uh, there's actually four possibilities for the model which I uh, was choosing from. I gave you the most complicated possibility. Okay, cool. thanks. No worries. Somebody else? All right, David, thank you very much. And we look forward to seeing you here for the following month. Yes, I look forward to it as well. Thank you, everyone. Take, take care. Bye-bye.